Okay, hi everyone. Let me thank you for all being here and welcome to the FORCE online seminar. Well, I'm going to talk about the FORCE a little bit as usual. So FORCE is dedicated to provide free high quality outreach events and online seminars to reach broader robotics and control engineering communities around the world. Thus, Tansan and I periodically invite the distinguished people like Dr. Chaudhary to give their talks on recent research developments related to robotics and the control engineering. The aim of the force connecting academicians and government industry researchers with each other through the research and education activities. So we cordially hope that you will enjoy all the force online seminars and you will find them highly valuable for your own research. By taking this opportunity, I also acknowledge the support from IEEE Control System Society where you can also find the past first videos and many other talks at the IEEE CSS video library webpage. Let me also mention about the WebEx. So during the talk, you will be all muted. If you are not, please mute yourself. If you want to ask questions at the end of the presentation, you can either unmute yourself or you can either utilize the chat box option. And this session is going to be recorded and will be shared on YouTube course website as well as the IEEE CSS website. So if you don't want your voice to be included in the video, just ask your questions through the chat. I joined with Tansel Yusulun. He is an associate professor at the Department of Mechanical Engineering of the University of South Florida. We are very proud today to host Dr. Girish Chowdhury. Girish Chowdhury is an associate professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and he is a director of the field robotics engineering and science of shortly fresh, I like that by the way, at UIUC, and the chief scientist at the Illinois Autonomous Farm. Girish holds a joint appointment with the agricultural and biological engineering and computer science. He is a member of the UIUC coordinated science lab. He holds a PhD from 2010 Georgia Institute of Technology in Aerospace Engineering. He was a postdoc at the Laboratory of Information and Decision Systems of the MIT between 2011 and 2013. He was an assistant professor at Oklahoma State University between 2013 and 2016. He also worked with the German Aerospace Center Institute of Flight Systems for around three years. Giri's work on the AI and adaptive flight control has led to several key advances to flight control and they were memorial award by Aerospace Guidance and Control Committee. Girish is the author of over 100 publications in adaptive control, autonomy and robotics, and he is a PI on NSF, AFSR, NASA, ARPA-E, DOE and ONR grants. He is the winner of Air Force Young Investigator Award and several best paper awards, including the best system paper award at RSS 2018 for his recent work on the agricultural robot Terra Sanchia. He is the co-founder of EarthSense, and he is working towards making sustainable, farming profitable with ultralight field robots. Well, for all you who are here right now, I would like to thank Girish for participating in our forum as a speaker. Girish, as you have the presentation, board, please go ahead and start your presentation. Stage is yours. Thank you so much, Marva. It's, it's a great pleasure uh, to be here on this fourth seminar. Um, I'm assuming you can all hear me okay. If not, let me know. And of course, it's a great pleasure to, uh, to be invited by Tansel, who is uh, one of my uh, oldest friends, I, I would say. We went to graduate school together at Georgia Tech and uh, did a, made a lot of adventures in uh, in adaptive control. Uh, and so this is a, and and again, like the 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 thing that I want to talk about are basically things that I picked up when I joined the PhD program at Georgia Tech, um, and and have just been continuing. And it's been a long story since then. What I'm going to talk about today are some of the very recent works that we've done in this area. So in the last two to three years. Primarily by my PhD student Girish Zoshi, who is now at MathWorks, uh, my MS student Jasvir Virdi, uh, who is now in industry, and my postdoc, current postdoc Prabhat Mishra, who is on the market, by the way, 
and has done a lot of uh, you know the the work that uh, I'll present in the deep MPC. So um, overall, uh, my group works on robotics and autonomous robotics in particular. Um, and this has been right from the beginning of my career. But in in that field of robotics, which is huge, our focus is not so much on the hardware, although recently you might have seen some stuff from our group that is uh, focused on hardware. Most of our stuff is typically focuses on the AI. And particularly in that AI, uh, one of my most favorite topics is adaptive control. And today I'm going to talk about that, adaptive control. And, and so it's going to be fairly theoretical, more, uh, more on the uh, mathematical side of things. I'll, 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 uh, I'll, I'll give you a glimpse of the, the acts that we're doing, but this talk is, is mostly about learning for control um, and particularly for adaptive control. So what is this, this whole business of uh, adaptive control, right? And, and this, is, this is a picture that you might have seen that Tansel uh, might have also show, shown, right? And we've kind of come up with this uh, a long time ago. But the standard way in which we kind of think of control systems or engineering systems is that first we have the system, then we kind of make some kind of a mathematical model. Nowadays, we like to use machine learning to do that. Then we take this mathematical model and come up with control and planning. Sometimes we try to uh, use reinforcement learning to kind of put this system in, um, you know, in an end-to-end -end manner. But the real challenge of autonomy and control and why you know, control engineers exist is, is what happens when you deploy this system in the real world. So this is an example, uh, work from my PhD thesis, where an airplane is deliberately made to throw half of its wing off in mid-flight. So the question for the adaptive control, the question for the robotics expert, for the autonomy expert, is what happens when, when something like this happens? You know, if you put it from a machine learning perspective, right, uh, a question that, that I would ask a computer scientist would be, in this case, my test data or my validation set where I'm in the field is different from my training set. What happens? when this mismatch exists. And I think the whole history of adaptive control is kind of focused on this idea, is being able to deal with these changes. Now, the question is, how do we do that? Um, so this is back in 2013, when Tansar and I were both doing PhD. And at that time, we did it using uh, a mix of traditional adaptive control, a little bit of neural network learning, and primarily a lot of heuristic-based adaptive guidance. So in particular, in this case, so, so the, the airplane throws half the wing off. Uh, it then has, uh, you know, basically it's lost all the aileron on that side. So, and it's trying to do a loitering maneuver, right? So it's going round and round in circles. Um, it's, it has to, there's, there's heuristics in there that say, okay, you've lost half of your lift. So you need to go faster. So that's the first thing it's doing. It's trying to turn, but as it's turning, it, two things are happening. One is that it's losing lift, and it's trying to therefore increase angle of attack, but as it's trying to increase angle of attack, it's hitting the angle of attack barrier, so the controller is telling you, no, 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 you, you shouldn't do that, you, should, you shouldn't be trying to turn. So that's why you end up seeing this limit cycle where it's trying to turn and then not turn, turn and then not turn. Um, you know, I won't talk too much about this, but suffice to say we did it twice in the same experiment. Both cases, it uh, was able to keep it up there. And the goal though, from, from since that time in my mind is that how can we do this while telling the controller the least amount of things? So in this case, what did the controller know? It knew that there was going to be, or it knew when a, a failure or a fault happened. It didn't know what it was, but it knew that it happened. Also the algorithms on the controller were designed in a heuristic way, taking into account all of the physics of airplanes that we know. And they were trying to make sure that the guidance the trajectories that are being commanded were somehow uh, kept in some loop. So again, the, the overall question is, how do we create adaptive intelligent controllers that can deal with this training and test set mismatch and how they can adapt? The overall, you know, the broader, bigger term goal, of course, is to create like this mythical uh, adaptive control hardware that you can just plug into any airplane, just like a, you know, a human pilot would, be able, like if they can fly one airplane, they can fly five different other airplanes. So with very little learning, they can learn. So 
the two questions that come come there is one can you adapt uh, given some experience and two can you learn over the long term which means if you've flown three planes are you better at flying the fourth plane so these are these are the, the things that that we really care about in my group um and and we think that there's there's got to be ways of doing that that are just you know that are better than brute forcing reinforcement learning uh, for autonomy and you know i love reinforcement learning it's a great uh, topic of study when you don't want to make any assumptions about the system it works great in systems like games where you know uh, the worst you can do is lose some points but when you're thinking about flying an airplane you know every mistake has severe consequences and you know and we have all of this knowledge that we've been building up over the past 70 years or I mean, more than 100 years now of flight. And in reinforcement, we're just going, oh, we're just going to throw that away and learn from scratch. That doesn't seem like, you know, a way to do things. And we know that when we do things like that, we end up with novel policies. And I think this is great computer science um, and science in general. But those novel policies may not make sense uh, to people who are, uh, you know, who are trying to deal with this uh, system. Uh, and of course, they can also lead to these kind of uh, weird outcomes and again this is you know at this point this is three years old what i'm showing those videos this field of reinforcement learning is extremely going forward really fast and this is not a criticism on reinforcement learning but rather more a question on how should we look at control problems and and, and i don't think that brute forcing reinforcement learning is the right way of doing it so the questions we ask is you know will the control that we create will it generalize uh, and will it adapt? And you know, and if it doesn't, then this is the kind of situation that you might run in, right? Where uh, you know you have a great system that you've created, and um, but at time of demo, it doesn't work. So how do you deal with those edge cases? And if you look at machine learning, there's been a lot of excitement, of course, and supervised learning, which is uh, you know uh, what people now call or are now synonymizing with deep learning, uh, is is really exploding. And this is this was 2016 Andrew Ng's uh, NIPS tutorial, and I think if anything, it has even you know gone, it's been taken up more than uh, exponential. Transfer learning is getting better. Unsupervised learning is slowly getting better, but reinforcement learning uh, has been has been kind of stuck a little bit. And if you look look at this, right, um, it's primarily because the way we are learning, and so the the motivation of reinforcement learning is let's learn like animals do through experience, which is great, but the complex types of tasks that we learn have an ontogeny, right? So for example, if my daughter is going to ever learn to ride a scooter, which I think she will, she's going to transfer all the knowledge from her childhood, from being able to walk, to being able to ride a tricycle with training wheels and riding a bicycle, and then finally scooters, right? So at every step of the way, she's adding complexity, you know, it's, 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 there's, there's a clear transfer that's happening. There's a clear leveraging of prior knowledge that's happening. And this is, you can see this in the animal kingdom too. They are, animals are built in with many behaviors and those behaviors they use as they learn. So this idea of, of let's start from scratch, let's make no assumptions, while is, is good science, it's not necessarily what we need for control. But on the other hand, this idea of adaptive control also where we're making a lot of structure, we're putting a lot of structure, we're making a lot of assumptions is, is also limiting, right? So it's not necessarily able to generalize. So the question is, how can we be in the middle? And we really strongly believe that real world autonomy is somewhere in between. And I think more and more uh, the community is seeing this. So I'm, I'm kind of inspired on this slide by Ben Recht, uh, in one of his talks I saw. And you know, Ben Recht, of course, learns the L4DC, um, conference series, the learning for control, decision and control. And it, the slide is is funny to me uh, because I'm trained as a control scientist uh, formally. And we always thought that reinforcement learning was a subset. So yes, yes, that's that's what we think. But if you go talk, now, now that I'm more working on AI and ML, uh, and I talk with my colleagues in AI and ML, they think that RL is a subset of ML and control is even a smaller subset of ML. And I think it's really, it's really that story of the seven wise Indians, you know, trying to figure out the elephant by touching one part of uh, the elephant's body, right? So one is touching the tail, others touching the trunk. 
I think it's just, it's the same problem. We're looking at it differently, right? Control people, what do you care about? We care about stability. ML, what do you care about? We care about performance. So the question is, how do we bring these together? And this is, of course, a long, long story. And obviously, I'm not claiming that we are solving any of this uh, entirely, but we are trying to make progress towards it. And the first, the big thing that, that we've been asking for the last three to four years is, how do we use deep learning in control and not lose stability guarantees? Things that I'm gonna talk about then are deep model reference adaptive control. So here we've taken a traditional control architecture that has been studied since the 50s. It is known to fly on a bunch of different airplanes and systems, and we're adding deep learning to it. Uh, there's some work in adaptive policy transfer order, which I won't touch upon today, but if you want, you can email me and I'll get you in uh, contact or give you those papers. Um, and then I'll also talk about deep model predictive control, which is uh, our uh, ongoing work, papers are being written on this right now, on how we can take deep learning and put it in um, on predictive control. So the underlying philosophy of the work that we have here is really these three things. So first, a philosophy, hypothesis, whatever you wanna call. It. So the first is that bringing together adaptive control and deep learning will lead to robust controllers with long-term learning, right? Uh, by leveraging existing control architectures, so not starting from scratch, right? Not saying that, okay, we'll just figure out how to fly this helicopter by crashing you know, a million times. So by not doing that, we will enable domain, not, we will bring domain knowledge to the learning process, which we know in many other learning areas is critical to improving uh, the, the learning process and making it more understandable, more re realizable. And you know the the final thing, which is more like really the the key one of the key contributions of our works is viewing the deep learning more. You know, I mean, I, I don't want I I hate to call it inspired by human brains because I don't think we really understand how humans' brains work uh, as well as we should. But but overall, in general, separating those learning scales into real time onboard learning to the dreaming state where you're learning offline, you're, you know, you're just thinking what happened and improving a representation. Separation of those will lead uh, to long-term learning on real world robotics applications. Like you can make deep learning fly on an, uh, on an aircraft and, and it actually has guarantees and works better in performance too. So the main protagonist in, in our talk, of course, is uh, deep, neural networks and for, and of course deep neural networks are very popular nowadays because of the deep convolutional uh, neural networks and these have made severe contributions to put it really uh, in a um, in a very generalistic manner right you could say that the the key kind of advance in deep learning from the regular neural networks was the addition of depth it's not that simple of course it was addition of depth, it was better computation, it was better data sets, and then a number of changes, very important architectural changes that people made that led to those Turing Awards and many other things. But this is there is no doubt in anybody's mind uh, anymore that deep learning is one of the most powerful supervised learning approaches that we know about. It of course has issues and they need to be fixed and, uh, and you know a lot of people are working on it. And it's also no longer this case uh, that is just about making the deeper and bigger model. Now we know that in many cases, uh, you can really compress those models that are, that are very big. Um, but in the beginning, it was like that. The, the big successes of deep learning have been in image processing. Image processing is an immensely difficult, uh, difficult area and, 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 and heuristic-based methods have struggled on image processing. So deep learning was a respite when you know, deep learning came across and these difficult problems, like the you know, simple problems, uh, starting with classification, finding objects uh, in the image, finding multiple objects in the image, and then even doing instant segmentation, like finding just the mask that fits the object. These have been now fairly to a very large extent solved by deep learning. Um, uh, even there's been a lot of uh, intersection of deep learning and natural language processing, caption generation, things like this have been uh, have been very good. Now this is an old result, 2015. More recently, there's been a lot of advances in uh, in generative networks, um, and so this is a case where they got they got Mona Lisa to talk, 
And then also, I mean, you have to give credit to the machine learning community for doing, you know, cool demos. And 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 this is one of them. There's this other thing that I'm was very impressed recently was, uh, I think that it was a protein unfolding deep network, and then there was a dynamic uh, a Navier-Stokes equation predicting uh, deep network. In my lab, we've used this um, to kind of. Um, uh, propel this idea of agricultural scouting, which I'm not really gonna talk about much today, but we created this, this little robot, it's now being manufactured by EarthSense that can navigate under canopy and then process that data and create numbers out of it. So this is a very difficult machine vision problem where we are detecting just the stems. Here we are detecting just the corn ears um, uh, with in, in immense visual clutter. And all of this uh, has been possible uh, the core engine is deep learning. There's, of course, a lot of algorithmic work. Here is a detection and a tracking method. Uh, this is 3D reconstruction with LiDAR. So a lot of interesting stuff um, can be done by bringing deep learning together with other uh, algorithmic methods. And it's making you know, a real-world difference. Um, but today what I'm going to talk about, keep the talk focused on this idea of uh, adaptive control. Now. In particular, let's start with model reference adaptive control. So here the idea is that you have, you know a part of your dynamics, you don't know the other part. You also have a reference model that that's a model that tells you how you'd like the system to behave. And then uh, the difference between what you're doing and what the reference model is doing feeds into your adaptive controller. So the main thing this does is that it takes the control problem and it adds a lot of structure to it. And the structure or the prior domain knowledge comes from your, uh, your, your control, existing control architecture. So let's put some more specifics on top of it. So just to keep things simple, let's uh, start with this system, x dot equal to fxu. Uh, we'll say that x is in uh, rn, u is in r, um, and in this case, a square system because uh, just for the technicality, but it doesn't have to be this. Uh, in our papers, you'll see a lot of relaxations of this. Um, and then F is uh, is unknown in this case, but it satisfies conditions for a unique solution. And you have a model reference adaptive uh, control for, for the reference. Uh, you have a reference dynamical system that you're trying to track. So that's given here. Um, its states are known, its inputs are known, and its dynamics are also known. And its states match the states of the, the system. And this, this idea comes up again and again in many different ways of control. Tube-based MPC, a lot of number different ways of reference governors, uh, many places. And the idea is that you are trying to figure out the necessary forces, which we'll call x dot desired here uh, from the state space perspective, uh, in form of a pseudo control, right? So the pseudo control is new. We'll say that new is x dot desired. And if you knew f, and if it were invertible, given the desired forces, which is uh, the x desired x dot, you can go backward and control the u. But the problem is you don't know f. So what you have is f hat. f hat is your best guess at f. And, uh, and so the, the u that you have to allocate is uh, f hat inverse x nu. So this leads to a very classic control architecture. So in this control architecture, what you see, here is your F. This is the model inversion-based architecture. Here is your F hat inverse. It's allocating a control U. That control U is, let's say, on the baseline, is being created by a feedback term, which is this PD compensator, proportional derivative compensator. No integral part here, very important, because that's where the adaptation comes in, which is being fed by the tracking error E, which is the difference between the state and the reference model. And then there's a feed forward part, which is coming from the reference model. So, you know, textbook control architecture. What we then do is we look at x dot. x dot is x dot is equal to f of xu. So if you just subtract and add f hat from it, you now get your dynamics with the modeling error. You have f hat, which is your dynamics that you know, and the modeling error, the difference between f and f hat. The idea in adaptive control is adding this additional term here that is being adapted using the tracking error, which provides it a dense uh, reward, such and so that we can adjust this control to deal with this modeling error. So 
if you figure out the tracking neural dynamics of the system, so you take x x dot uh, x and x x reference, you derivate it, and just you know figure out the math on this, you'll end up with this tracking error dynamics. So you have e dot equal to a e, which is where the a is actually coming from your PD term, um, and new a d minus delta, where delta is this guy here f minus f hat, and new a d is the output of your adaptive control. So your total control action now is your feet back, your feet forward term, and this adjusting adaptation term. And when you go back in the dynamics, you'll end up with this. So obviously now this thing becomes clear. If new AD minus delta is zero, then you recover exponentially stable tracking error dynamics. But this is a little bit tricky here. There's, this is where like kind of two thoughts separate. So one thing is pointwise. So Pointwise in time, can you get new AD to track delta? This leads to what I will liberally call here as high gain approaches, although they are not necessarily uh, always high gain and they have ways of dealing with it. Um, so the idea is where new AD is instantaneously pointwise in time suppressing delta. And the other approach, the approach that I'm going to talk about today, is uniformly in space and time, new AD minus delta is zero. So new AD minus delta, given any x, you know, new AD minus delta is always less than epsilon. This is what I, I call long-term learning or a learning-based approach. So therefore, then the question becomes, what is the form of new AD? So, uh, so we have delta. Uh, we can say, just to begin with, that the, 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 in the case of structured uncertainty, which is classical adaptive control, delta is given as a linear combination of known basis functions. And then new AD can become a linear combination of the same known basis functions. And you know the idea is try to figure out what W star is. In the world of neural networks, in the unstructured uncertainty, we say that delta is a linear combination of some feature vectors. Um, and these feature vectors, uh, they can be either the, the spatial type, which are the radial basis function ones, or the graph type, which are the neural network ones. But you, in both cases, you have this uh, universal approximation property. That tells us that um, that there exists some set of weights such that new AD or this this the delta is the output of the neural network plus some error, right? So that's kind of in this case, this is what you would set new AD to be. And in both cases, what you want to do is drive new AD minus delta to zero. And in the case that we're interested in, uniformly over space, so over x, so all on any given x, you want to find a weight such that new AD minus delta x is is, uh, is uh, very close to zero. Um, and this can be posed, uh, classically we have posed this as a concurrent learning uh, MRAC problem. This was back uh, in the way when, when we were doing PhD. And, and the idea in adaptive control basically uh, is that, um, is that it's, it's, it's in a way similar to policy gradient in reinforcement learning. Uh, but the idea is, is essentially you want to minimize the instantaneous tracking error. But you, if you just did that, and there's a great paper by Anaswamy that shows that, if you just literally change your weights based on the tracking error, that doesn't guarantee stability. So what you want to do is you want to constrain that weight update with uh, in, in a way that reduces the energy in the system. And the way adaptive control does that is by minimizing this, um, uh, or, or putting a constraint here. Uh, so the lead derivative of the cost function, uh, or the, sorry, the Lyapunov function uh, is less than or equal to zero. So this is what we call the Lyapunov constraint. So if you go through the math, uh, then you end up with this type of adaptive law, uh, where you have these terms that are coming from the Lyapunov equation. Uh, and we know that these types of rank one adaptive laws, uh, they're basically gradient descent with a constraint. They have no memory, they don't, uh, they, they're not guaranteed to find the optimum in all cases. They get stuck in local minima and you need things like persistence of excitation uh, to kind of make them work. So here we now get these two kind of different approaches. So you have these instantaneous adaptation approaches which try to just say, well, we don't really care about learning. As long as new AD is uh, suppressing delta pointwise in time, we can get really good performance. And that's a pretty valid approach. It's very fast. It doesn't need a lot of computational power. But computational power is not no longer uh, an issue uh, on most small 
robots now, and even and certainly not on airplanes and bigger uh, systems. So, so the idea is then, can you take that data? Can you leverage the compute that you have available to improve, to do learning and control? So in our work in the past, we've done, which I won't talk about this today, we've done things like concurrent learning, model reference adaptive control. Uh, Tansel and I worked on some parts of that. Uh, Gaussian process model reference adaptive control, where we added this idea of Gaussian processes, it's a, which is a generalization of radial basis function neural networks. And but what I'm going to talk about today is this idea of deep model reference adaptive control. So what happens here? So if you look at this, this setup, right, we are assuming that our basis function minus this uncertainty is, um, is, is kind of within a ball of epsilon. But if you look at the, the, the theorem, the universal approximation theorem, whether it's for RBF or for this uh, neural networks, it refers to a compact set. It says that if as long as your uncertainty is within a compact set, I can guarantee this. Now, for the radial basis function approaches, uh, which are very common uh, in adaptive control, and, and in some in some cases, I, I would even say that they are the favorite uh, because you know they are very understandable. Um, what in those approaches, what we do is we set a. You know, our basis functions are basically these bell curves, these correlation points where uh, if X is equal to XC, then this evaluates to the max. And as X goes away from XC, it evaluates zero. So it's really like this uh, co correlation or um, correlation term between any two points that has this Gaussian distribution. So in this case, for example, uh, if this is my trajectory, this is my uncertain trajectory, my red uh, curve, and this is where I have put these basis functions. Then across there, I have great coverage of this thing. But anywhere else, like here, because I have no basis functions there, essentially, no matter what I do to my weights, this thing is just basically going to evaluate to zero. I will not have any coverage there. So you can solve this problem by adapting this, uh, this set of basis functions uh, by making it grow or shrink based on your uncertainty. And we've studied that in a lot of depth with our work in Gaussian process um, adaptive control. And that's what the Gaussian process idea does. It, it gives you a budget. It says, okay, you can only have 100 points. And then given your dynamics, you can you know, then spread those points or keep those points tight. And by doing that, you can try to guarantee the best uh, coverage. And it's, it's obviously limited uh, because of uh, you know, those limited number of points. Um, it has lots of benefits. It gives you uh, confidence in predictions. That's great. Um, but 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 you get limited because of this uh, this spatial uh, kernel design. Now this is well known overall in machine learning, and that was kind of one of the big things that happened with deep learning was that they were able to kind of get better performance by moving to a different way of feature construction. So just taking a step back, and I'll even point you to our latest CSM article that appeared in February. Uh, um, it was mostly on spatial temporal learning, but we had a little section there about feature learning in machine learning. If you're new to this area, you could take a look there. There's basically three ways in machine learning that you can do feature engineering. One is the traditional way in which you look at the dynamics and physics of the system uh, and come up with these heuristic features. So X square, sine theta. Second is the Gaussian process way where the features are spatially correlated. The third is the graph way. So where the features are learned using a directed acyclic graph. That is what deep learning is. So in deep learning, what we do is that we say that, what if I learn those features? So phi of x is a composition of a set of other nonlinearities. So phi1, w1, y, so this is the most, uh, I guess, the outer layer. Um, then phi2, w2, so phi2 is, this, is the second layer with another weight with a feature phi3 and so on and so forth until you go uh, to the end where you get the x out. And those non-linearities, these phi's, uh, can be the small phi's of phi1s and phi2s, can be several different types. In the past, they were studied quite a bit with this sigmoidal and tan h, and these are nice because they are differentiable. But more recently, people switched uh, in the deep learning community to these things that are called ReLU, 
re rectified linear unit. And they're not differentiable at this point, but there's a lot of algorithmic tricks you can do to just get around that. And I think that was a very refreshing thing that, that in my opinion, that has been added uh, by the CS machine learning communities where, you know, while, while we were really worried as control scientists, including me, uh, about this uh, differentiability here, uh, there was, uh, you know, folks just algorithmically dealt with it, and now we get much better performance. And, and there's ways actually now, the theory is kind of following now with what's happening here. So again, going back to the universal approximation theorem, the universal approximation theorem really says that if the weights of the, in, uh, like if you have, uh, this is, and I'm just saying it for the two layer network, and actually it's enough, like two layers are enough to guarantee the universal approximation theorem, says that if I have these two layers with two weight matrices, W and V, there exist this nice sets of weights, W star and V star, such that uh, over this X on the compact domain D, the difference between this is always um, um, epsilon or less than epsilon. And then there's a lot of work that shows that by adding more layers, this gets better. I'll point to this work by Shrikant, uh, Xiang and Shrikant, um, and where they've shown that the number of ReLU neurons needed by a shallow network to approximate a function is exponentially larger than the corresponding number of neurons needed by a deep network for a given degree of function approximation. Now there's more work, there's work by Telgrasky, there's also an immense amount of empirical evidence that tells that shows us that by adding layers, uh, we get better performance. So the, I guess, almost a conjecture, or I, I don't, it's not, a, it's a speculation or a hypothesis, definitely not a conjecture, is that the compact set D becomes bigger uh, when we add more layers. So how does this whole deep learning business work? So it's an acyclic graph, right? So you start, so let's take this image here, seven. Now this is just a matrix, right? As you know, from your basics of image processing, um, each of these are just 256 values uh, of gray. Um, and so we take this matrix, we spread it out, and in convolutional neural networks, you would do some spatial filtering, but I'm going to skip that for now. You spread it out and you feed it to this deep neural network, right? And then when you feed it, there are some weights, or you initialize it, you have to initialize it with some weights, and they can't be zero. And it will predict something. So in this case, this is a classification problem, is going to predict five, it just you know, as an example. Five is wrong, so then you have a loss. That loss tells the neural network that, hey, you did the wrong, you did the wrong thing. Based off the loss, then you apply back propagation, which is basically you know, the chain rule of calculus, and go backward in there, um, and layer by layer by layer, you adjust the weights uh, using a form of gradient descent. Um, and then when you do this, uh, eventually, this loss of the back propagation starts to go down, and your weights get adjusted, and all these gates open, and uh, correct gates open, and finally, when you show seven, it starts to show seven. And this is, of course, very simplistic view of how deep learning works. Uh, is, um, the key here is, is, is this idea of having an over-parameterized model. So you create, like, whereas in, in Gaussian processes and other types of um, learning approaches, we spent a lot of time finding the right set of parameters, and, and in Gaussian processes, its idea is actually to only to increase parameters as needed. In deep learning, we do the opposite. We start with a million parameters, like a lot of parameters, and we just kind of let it uh, learn. Now, uh, and it turns out that that approach uh, seems to work well in cases like images, where there's a lot of different instances, like a set, like this data comes from what's known as the MNIST data set. It's like one of the most basic machine learning data sets. But the idea is that seven can be written in so many different ways by people. So can I can my learning can my learning method figure out all those different ways of writing seven? And in convolutional neural networks, what you have is that your deep neural network is the last bit here, right? And before there are a bunch of these layers where you're spatially filtering uh, these pieces here. The main idea again is the same: is you have this tremendous amount of over-parameterization, and then final, finally you're just trying to learn all the weights right from the beginning all the way to the back. So again, the way these things are trained are with, um, uh, with supervised data. So you would give it a picture of a deer, and you would say, this is a deer on the other side. 
So how do we take this and apply to adaptive control? So the way, one way to do that is by, by basically saying that new AD is now a acyclic graph. This is my output of a deep neural network and plug that back in here. Everything stays the same. The only thing I've done is change new AD to this deep network. So why deep? Well, I mean, as our results would show you, uh, primarily because it gives better representation uh, capability. Uh, and you can, uh, the speculation, the main speculation here is that compact set D is larger. And I'll show you how that is. The question is, so this is straightforward. Okay, so I just made a longer, deeper network. And people have had studied neural networks for time immortal. So it brings me back to Lewis's work uh, um, where they showed the stability by using Taylor series approximation. But this, this approach is not that generalizable to multiple layers. So the main contribution in the work by Girish Doshi is uh, to basically treat this as two learning at two different scales. The first is at the layer, the level of the last layer, right? So this is the layer which we can, so basically we assume that this, this, this rest of the network here outputs P in machine learning, we call this a latent vector. Um, and then the last layer is adapting in real time, fast adaptation based on this. And we adapt these inner layers only in, um, um, only offline. With that is proven a number of theorems. Uh, so one is the tracking error and weight error bounded. The other is mean square uniform ultimately boundedness. And the third is on sample complexity. So let me show you how the architecture works. So here we have our standard MRAC, right? Which looks, which is here. The, the last layer is here. The last layer is applying the standard neural network update laws that we have learned in, in the MRAC literature. But this V is now an output from a deep neural network. And this deep neural network is being trained in using a training buffer uh, offline or in, you know, in spare time or just you know, at a different time scale than this. And then we can add a lot of uh, conditions here. Like, okay, when do I pick X? And when do I pick new to send to my buffer? When do I train the buffer? After the buffer train, when do I accept the output and then put it back in here? But if you, I mean, and so this is the deep feature learning layer. Uh, then this is the, um, the final layer weight. And, and essentially this whole architecture um, can then be proven to be stable. So I'll skip the details of the proof. But the main idea is that you basically follow the same method as you would in uh, in your standard adaptive control. Uh, you apply the the universal approximation theorem, and since you're kind of and it becomes a switch system because you're you're flipping those fee, and it's very reminiscent of the concurrent learning proofs actually that we've had uh, because as the fees are, are switching, but the last layer is still you know uh, proven stable using the standard method. I think it's very liberating doing it in this way by separating the computational time scales, which is, I think, really the one of the very key kind of like I would say, uh, you know, learning focused assumption. Uh, by separating those scales, we we get we make the 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 math really straightforward for the for the proving. Uh, we can also prove generalization errors, so that so that that this this thing is actually if you just use the output of the uh, controller without even learning, it's still a good, um, it's a good, it's a good way of doing control. Uh, and we can uh, prove sample efficiency errors. And again, I'm kind of going to skip some of this. And the sample complexity errors uh, or sample complexity says that uh, the number of training samples grows at least linearly with the number of tunable parameters to achieve specified generalization error. So that's good news. That means, you know, and, and samples are not an issue in the control setup, right? It's all self-supervised in the way we have, we have posed it. Nobody has to sit down and give us these labels. The, the tracking error is automatically giving us these labels. So what I'll show you now is some of our results. So we, we, we implemented this, Jasvir and Zoshi, they implemented this. This appeared in the Coral paper. So first, so what, what is happening here is that there is a fan. Uh, let me just go back here. So there's a fan and there's a tiny helicopter rotor craft, a quad rotor, and it has a flag underneath it. And the flag is added to create lots of 
uncertainty, non nonlinearity. The rotorcraft doesn't know about the fan. It doesn't know about the flag. It's just basic kinematic model. First, we study PID control, and as soon as it gets in front of that fan, uh, it just you know crashes. MRAC is able to keep the things stable. So by MRAC, I mean like a GP MRAC, Ocean Process MRAC, able to keep things stable, um, works in in a reasonable way. Uh, but DMRAC, uh, you can see, does a pretty good job of doing this. So this is good. This is the first thing where we get a sanity check that all right, uh, in presence of strong disturbances, we are getting uh, good performance. And you know you can look at the graphs; they they look pretty nice. The second is this is where it starts to get interesting. Now what we did is we cut the blade and then we taped it with a tape. Now this is similar to that experiment we did uh, at the beginning that I showed, but in this experiment now, we don't tell the controller at all when nobody knows when the blade is going to chip off. So now, so the PID controller, the blade chips um, and then, then uh, basically, you know, is not able to hold. MRAC, blade chips, it's kind of, uh, okay, so chip as in it just basically flies off. And deep MRAC, it chips and it doesn't even care. It basically uh, is very quickly able to uh, adapt to it. Now, there are some other experiments that I'm not showing here, but in those experiments, what we did is we really tried to, what I call an ablation study. We shut off, we did two things. One is where we shut off the learning of the last layer and saw whether or not the deep network itself, whatever it has learned, is actually has enough things to generalize. And then we trained it with trajectories only clockwise and we tested it with clockwise and anti-clockwise trajectories and it worked. That's in the Coral paper. The second thing we did is that we then switched on that layer and pushed the system in a case like, like we showed you here, uh, in, a, in a case where there was no previous data. So this has never been trained. Uh, this neural, this controller has never been trained with the blade chipping off uh, situation. And it was able to adapt due to that last layer adaptation. Then what we did is we looked at the weights and we did what is known as a TSNE analysis to kind of see if the weights show some pattern. And then we saw very interesting patterns. So the low wind bias was here. The medium wind bias is kind of in the middle. The high wind bias weights are here. Now this is the same one network, one neural network that has been trained on all these cases. And then the rotor tip chipping is here. So it looks like it's it's actually taking this random set of weights and then you know doing something with them. Um, and this this is very promising uh, for in terms of the control. Now I'll end the talk with the work that uh, Pravath has been doing. And Pravath has been taking the stuff that uh, that we've done in MRAC and taking it to MPC, Montfort to control. MRAC is great. It's uh, it's my favorite because it's so well structured and you can you know prove a lot of uh, stability results and and things. But it's limited because you can't guarantee constraint satisfaction. There's no guarantees of optimality. So in Prabhat's work, well, he's done a couple of things. First, he's made the system uh, discrete time uh, and which is more amenable to computational problems. It's it's nonlinear. Uh, so you have FXD here. It's GXD here now, both nonlinear. Um, and but you still have this affine control uh, coming in. And the goal is satisfy the physical constraint optimize the performance index and learn to reduce the uncertainty. So the idea is you have the adaptive control UA, which is basically coming from the deep MRAC type approach. We are just learning uh, the deep network to predict the uncertainty. And then it's a tube based MPC. So you have offline reference governor and an online reference tracker, right? So UA is W transpose V of X. And then you have your tube based MPC. So you have your, you know, the, the reference governor is creating this blue trajectory, um, and then, you know, you, you're you guaranteed to stay within this tube. Um, and then the total control is the UM, the control that the MPC is coming up with, and UA, the control that the adaptive controller comes up with. And so just to clarify, there's a paper CDC 2020, so just uh, uh, in December, and a new one uh, will come up hopefully this year. Again, the neural network is used, so we use the uh, the deep network. Uh, or in the first set of results, we're just going to use um, a single layer neural network to just kind of show that this idea works. Um, so you have the system, and you have a cost function. 
This is a finite horizon cost function with a final cost and a uh, cost into the future. Um, and the main point is here. So you follow standard tube based MPC, except the uh, control. So you know you have your uh, your system. Your your adaptive controller is coming from your uh, you know adaptive bit. Then you do your cost, uh, and then but, but when you apply the constraints, you say now that you plus the adaptive control has to stay within the constraint set. Then with this Prabhat has been able to show that this system is input to state stable. And of course, uh, on benchmark problems like the start trank reactor against tube MPC, this approach adaptive um, is is doing a lot better. And in this case, the uh, there's a, a sine t disturbance. In in our soon to be published work um, in deep MPC, we basically follow the same uh, method, uh, but we now have replaced the neural network with uh, deep learning. So it's like we're running out of time, uh, and this will come up on archive in a in a, in a couple of days. So the main idea is to the MPC, uh, the adaptive control is kind of looks like an additional disturbance. Over time, as the disturbance is learned by the adaptive controller, the effective disturbance actually becomes smaller, which results in better tracking. Uh, and then, you know, we use the standard projection operator on the last layer. In the inner layers, we use things like dropout and other regularization methods to make sure that the control is, uh, uh, that the new AD is, is, is regularized and, and not blowing up. Uh, and it consists only of bounded neurons, the last layer, for example, sigmoidal and tan edge, uh, and that also helps uh, ensure boundedness of the last layer. Uh, and therefore, the whole thing is, is bounded, and that's how we're able to show input to state stability uh, with, with, uh, with the deep learning. And, and uh, on wing rod dynamics, uh, this has now been val validated. Uh, this is a simulation benchmark problem. So again, you see tube MPC, uh, is not doing that well, uh, but with the shallow and deep, uh, we can do better. Again, I I I, I think the, these are promising results, but they're fairly. I think they definitely show that deep MPC works, but I think we need to do a lot of lot more benchmarking to really figure out, you know, how much better it's doing. And really, what what we would like to do now is is go back to that that blade chipping off problem, um, and and show that we can handle more cases in the same network. And I think that's really where the big gain in adding deep learning is going to be. So GPM rack works, right? GPMPC works if the only thing you're cared about, caring about is the tracking error. But what the deep learning can bring us, it looks like, is the ability to grow that compact set, which means that we can, the same learning element can handle multiple cases, right? And then of course the dream is that then it is that one neural network that can fly those 15 different planes, right? Or do those 15 different things. So just to end here, so it looks like deep MRAC can handle model changes. This means that we're seeing some kind of long-term learning. Uh, we're able to pose RL problems essentially as supervised learning problems, which significantly improve sample complexity. And this time separation enables uh, real world uh, dem demonstrations. So I think the future is is pretty bright for these uh, ideas of bringing together control. Again, just thanking everybody in the lab, but primarily Prabhat, uh, Jasveer, and uh, and Giri Zoshi, and uh, and uh, and and if you're if you're hiring for professors, I you know Prabhat is on the market, um, and I think it'd be a great great catch. So that's it for me. I'll I'll take questions, and I think Prabhat's also online. If you have questions um, overall. Uh, hey Gersh, can I ask uh, make some comments? Yeah, Who, who's this? Sorry. Okay, it's Ping Yao from Purdue. Uh, I'm a professor yeah. here. I'm also teaching uh, the adaptive control this semester, actually. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think uh, it's good that you are introducing deep learning, whatever, into the uh, the con control. I just want to make comments that the back in the uh, end of the case, um, around 2000. Uh, my fourth PhD actually working on the neural network based adaptive bus control. So that's uh, kind of very closely related to what you're presenting here. And there, uh, essentially, to say, you know, only you can guarantee, uh, you can also guarantee the transient control performance as well. 
Yeah, I mean, I agree with you, right? And there's been a lot of work, and that's kind of what I was saying. There's been a lot of work in adaptive control and neural networks. I mean, my PhD is also on adaptive control with neural networks, right? Concurrent learning neural network, adaptive control. We've done a lot of work in there. This is, and, and none of this is, we are all building on all of that work. The main thing that we're saying is that, uh, you know, by adding deep learning, we can get better performance, primarily through this separation, and by, if, like, if you look at, you know, even Lewis's result in 99, right, with adaptive control and neural networks, uh, you know, two layers, we have these Taylor series based methods where we can show uh, uh, stability. This is the same thing that I used in my thesis also. Uh, but what we're seeing here now is a different way of dealing with those stability problems through this time scale separation. But yeah, absolutely. There's been a lot of work in this area. I'm very excited to continue. Yeah, so I'm just um, some make some comments just exactly what your uh, time separation, right? And why we um, in terms of feedback control is similar to the PD. We are on, only just not using I and the I. You're know, slow, slow learning. You just uh, I, I have some. Yeah, you know, I think if you are, there are a lot of co uh, commonalities between uh, what you guys are working on and uh, whatever. My past work has been. Yeah, that that's great. I think we should definitely connect and find some ways to work together. Mm -hmm. Hey, Girish. Uh, nice talk. Um, uh, I not a, I'm I don't have a question, uh, but I have a comment. So about this compact set, right? Um, <laughs> last uh, two years ago, we published a paper on, you know, how we can enforce a strict constraint such that you know you can always if you start in a compact set with neural adaptive control you are guaranteed to stay on that set but uh, we basically use classical uh, you know the stuff that you know neural network wise this addressing the main purpose of the paper was to address catch 22 problems so mm -hmm. uh, I, I can send it to you then we can discuss more yeah absolutely and again this Compact set business has been around uh, quite like if you look at the Sanner and Slotin paper, even from the 92, right? That's, you know, it's that's that's what they've been saying right from there. And this is RBF. That was the first paper. And then we had the 99 paper by uh, by Lewis. Uh, that's exactly what both of them. I mean, Sanner and Slotin also provided a way to con to get the model reference, uh, the reference model in such a way that you try to stay in this compact set. Uh, but yeah, I think I think there's a lot more theory that we can build, and this area is so open. I really think uh, for adding theory uh, to control, and I think if we do it right, uh, as we have shown through real results on real aircraft, uh, that this is actually deployable on real world systems, which is something that like I personally really care about. I mean, you know, I think it's it's all great. Uh, to have simulation results and and you know winning in games, but if you can't get it on a robot, and if you can't get the robot to fly with half the wing off, then uh, you got to do it. No, absolutely. I mean, uh, practicality is very important. I mean, like robust performance, uh, addressing this catch twenty two problem, learning, um, just you know, um, stability is everything. You know, you know, robustness and performance as well. So. Yeah, and again, like even even with deep learning and neural networks, right? It's been that story, like what Bin was mentioning, right? I mean, it's like, you know, there's all these highs and lows, right? In the '90s, everybody was excited. Uh, then, you know, there was some nice results, and then it kind of died down. Now it's back up again. So I think, uh, um, you know, overall, I think we should just basically be focused on, uh, on on making sure that things actually work. So there's some chat questions which I don't know how to see. Okay. Um. Marve, can read it to yeah, you? Yeah, I can read it to you. Uh, it's from Alma Yolanda. So, dear Girish, you mentioned that computational complexity is not anymore a problem. Could you please? Yeah, yeah ab absolutely. Yeah, I'll I'll be very happy to explain that. So, so primarily because computers are getting better. So, uh, you know, we have the Raspberry Pi. Even three can do most of the math that we're doing here. Uh, second, secondly, because there's now new ways of compressing neural networks. So in some of the work, uh, which I didn't talk about at all, but we've used deep learning also for um, robot navigation in cornrows. And there, working with Vikram Adwe and Sarita Adwe and Shasha, uh, we showed that uh, 
a much, much, much smaller neural network when used in feedback can actually do the same thing. And they were able to show that it works on, um, um, on you know, just a Raspberry Pi 4 or, or a Jetson Nano. Uh, you can have drive the whole robot just using that. So I think computational complexity is, 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 is really not a limiting factor like it used to be in the past. Can I make a question? Yeah. Um, it seems that uh, the story of uh, approximate dynamic programming does not play a big role in the, the approach that you are following. Is this true or, or am I missing something? I think the the first set of the stuff that I should I, I'm just trying to show who is this I can't see. Uh, my name is Lemos. I'm speaking from Portugal. Oh, okay, hi. Yeah. So in the in the work I showed today, it is basically a it, it's it's the it's the classical model reference control adaptive control architecture. That is not an MDP based approach. The MPC work, although, can be posed in that way. It can be viewed as a model-based um, approximate dynamic programming approach. And we've done some work in that area, but today I focus mostly on uh, this problem because you know, if you take AD, approximate model, dynamic programming and then from there you can build reinforcement learning, um, those are, I think, great approaches. Uh, but they, this, what I like about this approach uh, that I'm showing today is that we leverage a lot of the control structure that's already there uh, to make sure that um, we can prove stability guarantees. Like if you know with reinforcement learning, for example, right? I mean, basically the thing that kills you is the exploration phase. Um, that is very difficult to guarantee anything there. Thank you very much for your answer. And thank you for our seminar. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you so thank you. much, John. Thank you for attending. I think we are done with the time and I don't see more questions. Uh, thank you, Girish, for your time and great seminar today. I hope to see you in person soon in the conferences. Let's yeah. I would like to thank to the, I mean, I would like to have a comment about the audience. So, uh, you know, I had my advisor, Girish's grand advisor, Tony Kalis, um, now my student, you know, uh, former student Merve, my new students. So it is a nice, um, <laughs> really, really. It's, it's historic moment. So I think, I think we should, uh, let me see if I can stop the sharing. We should take a screenshot or something. Right. We did get a screenshot. <laughs> you will be soon on the TV too. Yeah, we can look at this. Uh, can we send it to Girish as well? Yeah, yeah. We, should, we should send it to Dr. C and um, and Eric and everybody. This is like the, the legacy continues. Yeah, yeah. Eric was missing though. <laughs> yeah. so. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Girish. So I will let Matt conclude. Girish, welcome to you from Bangalore. Hey, Dr. Padi, how are you doing? <laughs> uh, how are you? Little, little bit. <laughs> It's exciting. I enjoyed your talk as usual. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's so nice much. to see yeah, our yeah. Giris Joshi's work. Yeah, very yes. good. Yes. <laughs> yes, and Giris Joshi comes from Dr. Padi's lab. So I think uh, yeah. that, that yeah. connection is also there. All right. So we'll, we'll talk more. I mean, I just a very, very quick question of unofficial, probably. I mean, all the all the work that you showed is our uncertainty is a function of state. Uh, what if it's a function of control as well? Yeah, that, that's a good question. I think, yeah, mostly this is a uh, uncertainties of the state and mostly it is all fully observed. Uh, I think it, it is possible uh, in some of the earlier works, uh, I think we have dealt with some uncertainties in control, but that's something that I think it's a great area of uh, continuation on this work. All right. And probably the work is more relevant to adaptive guidance in my view. Not, uh, not so much adaptive control per se. Yeah, so the results we showed were actually inner loop control. So on the yeah. on the quad rotor was the, the, the attitude control, but I'm sure it can also, the MPC work I'm sure definitely will yeah. be more applicable yeah. to the adaptive guidance. So, and I think that's one of the, I think, big contributions coming from Prabhat. So really looking forward to that. Okay.
All right. I look forward to have you here again sometime. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> ten years now. Ten years now, right? Yeah, All right. <laughs> okay. See you there. Bye. Okay. May I ask a question? Of course. Uh, Erdal is here hey, from Denmark. Erdal, how are you? <laughs> Fine, thanks. Uh, my question is. Um, uh, the quad rotors are quite agile and fast. So in my experiments, I did some similar experiments that you did with the fan until you learn this disturbance. Actually, everything is changing because the, the, the way that the wind is disturbing you is changing. Yeah. So yeah. simply there is no much time. Um, how did you deal with this problem? Yeah, I mean, that's where the adaptive control comes into play. Yeah, and actually, so, and that's what we were trying to, like, in the, in the, the, the good news with car is over-actuated, right? So, in the beginning, uh, we had a hard time showing the difference. Because <laughs> that actually works really well. And, you know, Tansel, I, and, you know, Dr. C, and we've spent a lot of time making sure adaptive control works. So, we made sure that the adaptive control that was on there, the shallow, was already able to handle those kind of disturbances. Uh, uh, and, you know, you can look at, like, I think with Rob Grandi, and uh, uh, Grande and um, and John Howe, we published a paper on something similar. We had a fan and a quad rotor. So we started with that control as the baseline. And then we added deep learning on top. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Hey, Ardal, nice to see you. <laughs> nice to see you. Yeah, nice to see you. And I hope you, you will come too soon, Erdal. Uh, you know, with- Hopefully, uh, with, uh, after with the- uh, after the vaccination. Yeah, yeah. exactly. You are doing great in the US. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Erkan is not online, right? <laughs> Erkan is know. probably sleeping. It's midnight in Australia. Yeah. Yeah. I had a chat with him yesterday though. Things are looking good yeah. on his side. Yes. Thanks. Hope to see you soon. Yep. Thanks, Thanks. Tansa. Thanks, guys. So I guess, I guess, Mary, you can finish. Hi, you can go ahead, but okay. I believe there is no more question, but Girish put his email on the chat. So if you have more questions or more offline questions, you can ask to him by email. Again, thank you, Girish, for attending today. It was a pleasure to have you on the first. Thank you. <laughs> this is a great, this is a great seminar series. Take care, everyone. Hope to see you next four seminars. <laughs> Bye. Goodbye.